You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, y'all. Spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 162 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all, thanks for tuning into the podcast. With the end of the last show, we left off with the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Gaines Mill, which took place on Friday, June 27, 1862. Near the end of that episode, we also assessed the performance that day of each of the commanding generals, saying that while Robert E. Lee started off the battle on the wrong foot, his personal control of the ensuing action meant that he ended up getting a passing grade for his actions at Gaines Mill. But Lee's counterpart doesn't get a passing grade for his actions on June 27th. George McClellan left everything north of the Chickahominy to Fitzjohn Porter, Unlike Lee, who abandoned his headquarters in order to direct events from the field, Little Mac never budged from his headquarters at the Trent House south of the river. When word came that night that Porter was defeated and would have to retreat across the bridges over the Chickahominy under cover of darkness, McClellan took it hard and became despondent. He also became angry and bitter, convinced that he was in this difficult position because the government in Washington hadn't heeded his repeated calls for more troops. Sometime between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. that night, McClellan gathered his corps commanders together, except Erasmus Keyes, who he had already ordered to begin retreating southward through White Oak Swamp. Little Mac acted as if he were considering leading a great assault across the Chickahominy to retake the ground that Porter had lost, but McClellan's performance was just that, an act. In fact, he had already committed to retreat south to the James River, as he had told his staff the night before, but in this conference with his top subordinates, he tried to look like the aggressive commander, itching to come to grips with the enemy army. It was pure theater, however. Little Mac painted the possible consequences of defeat in such dire terms that his corps commanders urged him not to risk it, but to save the army instead. In this way, McClellan cleverly manipulated his generals so that they recommended the course he had already decided upon. Little Mac, of course, feigned reluctance to retreat, but ultimately agreed with their recommendation and dismissed them. However, not all of McClellan's officers were satisfied with the decision to retreat. When 3rd Corps Commander Samuel Heinzelman informed his division commanders, Phil Kearney and Joseph Hooker, of the decision, they insisted on talking to McClellan to try to persuade him to launch an attack against Richmond instead. The day-long theatrics by Magruder's Confederate troops south of the Chickahominy had finally convinced Kearney and Hooker that there was no substance behind Prince John's performance. Telling McClellan that the enemy lines in front of Richmond were thinly held and could be easily broken, the outspoken Kearney angrily denounced the commanding general's decision to retreat. Kearney said, "'In order to retreat is wrong. Wrong, sir. I ask permission to attack Magruder at once.'" 
But McClellan, who was annoyed at having a division commander question his judgment, curtly responded, denied. But Kearney wasn't ready to concede. He had lost his left arm in Mexico and was referred to by Winfield Scott as, quote, the bravest man I ever knew, end quote. He now suggested an attack could be successful even if led by just two divisions, but McClellan stood firm and said the retreat would proceed as ordered. At that point, the hard-fighting, straight-talking Kearney verbally ripped into Little Mac for all to hear. A general who overheard this angry outburst later said, quote, Phil unloosed a broadside. He pitched into McClellan with language so strong that all who heard it expected he would be placed under arrest. End quote. Carney, though, wasn't placed under arrest, but neither was Little Mac swayed by his outraged subordinate's argument, for he ordered that the army's retreat southward to the James River would continue. And then, not long after his confrontation with Carney, at about 20 minutes after midnight, McClellan loosed his own broadside when he sent perhaps the war's most notorious telegram to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. George McClellan was upset, angry, and bitter. The strain of the day had so affected him that he was convinced that he'd faced superior enemy forces on both sides of the Chickahominy. He wrote a long, unhappy, and highly charged message to be wired to Washington to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. McClellan asserted, I have lost this battle because my force was too small. I again repeat that I am not responsible for this. He further declared, I feel too earnestly tonight. I have seen too many dead and wounded comrades to feel otherwise, that the government has not sustained this army. One is left to wonder what dead and wounded comrades McClellan is speaking of, since he never stepped foot outside his headquarters on Friday, unless it was to answer the call of nature. But little Mac wasn't finished. He concluded with the astonishing accusation, If I save this army now... I tell you plainly that I owe no thanks to you or any other persons in Washington. You have done your best to sacrifice this army. We might think that McClellan hit the send button on this late night message before he had fully considered its implications, but that wasn't the case, for he wrote to his wife saying, quote, They will never forgive me for that. I knew it when I wrote it, but as I thought it was possible that it might be the last I ever wrote, it seemed better to have it exactly true, end quote. In fact, the telegram's final sentence was so amazingly insubordinate that the shocked head of the War Department's telegraph office, Colonel Edward S. Sanford, simply deleted it from the message before passing along the rest of the telegram to Stanton. The result, though, was to fix McClellan's delusions even more firmly in his mind and increase his contempt for Stanton and Lincoln, since he assumed the Secretary of War and President didn't react to his accusation because of their guilty consciences. Spared from reading McClellan's absurd charge of treason, Lincoln's response was meant to encourage the obviously rattled general. The President telegraphed Little Mac, quote, Save your army at all cost, end quote. He promised to send what reinforcements he could, but, quote, of course they cannot reach you today, tomorrow, or next day. If you have had a drawn battle or a repulse, it is the price we pay for the enemy not being in Washington and the enemy concentrated on you, end quote. McClellan was spared from replying to that interpretation of events by the fact that shortly after he received it, rebel cavalry cut the telegraph lines. Meanwhile, in Richmond, there was relief and much excitement as word of a great Confederate victory north of the Chickahominy reached the rebel capital. Many people anticipated that Lee was now going to destroy the reeling Yankee army, and Robert E. Lee was certainly hopeful of doing so. He hadn't accomplished as much as he'd hoped to on June 27th, but it was a victory nevertheless, and Lee intended to fully exploit the advantage he'd gained by it. 
history never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Though June 27th had been a long day, it was an even longer night for men on both sides. The tired Union troops of the 5th Corps and the other supporting units spent the dark hours of the night crossing the Chickahominy, knowing that to still be on the north side of the river at dawn would mean destruction or capture. Still, some were just too exhausted to march and were captured the next morning. One of that number was Brigadier General John F. Reynolds. The well-respected Pennsylvanian, a brigade commander in McCall's division, fell asleep under a tree during the slow and fitful withdrawal and slept so soundly that he only awakened after daylight to find himself, much to his mortification, surrounded by Confederate troops. For the surviving Yankee soldiers, the night's march was a demoralizing trudge over the narrow bridges that crossed the Chickahominy. In the darkness and in the turmoil of the retreat, three separate artillery pieces slipped off the bridges and pitched over the side into the river. There was no time to try to retrieve them, and Porter's force moved on, having officially lost 22 cannons that day, 19 to the rebels, and 3 to the Chickahominy. Before the sun broke through the mist on the muggy morning of Saturday, June 28th, Fitzjohn Porter had successfully extracted all of his units to the south side of the river and destroyed the bridges, but there was still a much longer trek ahead for these Federals. The James River was 15 miles away as the crow flies, but there was no road southward that led directly to it, so for the crows it might be a 15-mile journey, but for these troops it would be a longer, circuitous march to arrive there. Porter reached the south side of the Chickahominy with roughly 29,000 men, but far more than just those troops would be making the march to the James. All told, McClellan's decision to retreat meant that he was going to have to move 100,000 soldiers, more than 300 pieces of artillery, which included 26 heavy siege guns that had already been brought forward, nearly 4,000 wagons, tens of thousands of horses, and 2,500 cattle. It was going to be a torturous, slow journey for many reasons, one of them being that the cattle and horses, which were generally in the vanguard, chewed up the roads with their hooves and left behind thousands of unwelcome and noxious pies in the road for the following soldiers to shuffle through. The ensuing rains would turn the few roads through White Oak Swamp into soupy, stinking streams of muddy manure. And to get to the James, the retreating Federals would have to traverse the White Oak Swamp. The previous day, McClellan had sent engineers into the area to find the best path through the marshy, difficult terrain. 
The engineers reported that it would be hard going, not least because bridges in the swamp that had been destroyed by the army weeks earlier to prevent any rebel flank attack from the south would now have to be hastily rebuilt. But by 7 a.m. on Saturday morning, the White Oak Swamp Bridge had been rebuilt and the lead troops of Key's 4th Corps were crossing it soon after on their way south. A few hours later, a second bridge had been completed at Brackett's Ford, one and a half miles away. As Stephen Sears points out in his book, To the Gates of Richmond, for all of McClellan's later claims about his army's well-organized, quote-unquote, change of base to the James River, the Army of the Potomac's shift southward was actually surprisingly inefficient, especially for a former engineer who prided himself on his organizational ability. The routes through White Oak Swamp hadn't been scouted, resulting in the entire army crowding the same road when multiple others were available, and some of those alternate routes were only discovered by accident during the retreat. McClellan simply didn't organize the march effectively, and as a result, the troops were constantly starting and stopping, which made for a long, wearying march through the eastern Virginia swamps. Though Porter's retreat across the Chickahominy and burning the bridges over the river had bought McClellan some time, since it would be nearly 24 hours before Robert E. Lee finally divined where Little Mac was heading and began pursuing, McClellan wasted nearly all of his advantage by mismanaging the march. This set up the likelihood of several more battles, in which the Army of the Potomac would have to hold off furious Confederate attacks before it reached the safe shelter of the Union gunboats on the James River. For the Confederates, the night of June 27th was melancholy and bittersweet. They had secured a hard-earned victory, but were done in by the effort and haunted by the aftermath of the bloody fighting. Not only were there nearly 2,400 dead bodies on the battlefield, but there were also about 9,000 wounded of both armies scattered all over the swamps and fields. The wretched groans, feeble calls for help, and pitiful cries for mother rose from all over the darkened landscape. A. N. Erskine of the 4th Texas recalled, quote, In going round the battlefield with a candle searching for friends, I could hear on all sides the dreadful groans of the wounded and their heart-piercing cries for water. May I never see any more such in life. End quote. All over the ground where the fighting took place, rebels sought out the wounded, and thousands from both armies were carried to makeshift field hospitals, where the surgeons spent all night sawing off shattered limbs by lamplight. Dawn on Saturday morning brought more light to see, but it didn't stop the flood of broken bodies coming in to the field hospitals. With daylight, many Confederates walked back over the ground of the battlefield and were astonished that anyone could have survived. The gruesome final poses of the dead and the ripped and mangled trees bore silent witness to the intensity of the carnage. When Stonewall Jackson rode over the ground that Hood's troops had crossed and then went up the hill where they had broken the Union position, he was impressed and said, quote, The men who carried this position were soldiers indeed. It was only on the morning of June 28th that Robert E. Lee learned that he hadn't faced the majority of McClellan's army on Friday, as he'd presumed. When Stonewall Jackson questioned a prisoner, he was surprised to learn the enemy line had been manned by only one corps plus one division. In fact, Jackson was so surprised that he angrily dismissed the information at first as a lie. The rebels would spend much of Saturday tending to the wounded and burying the dead. There were so many dead that not even the Confederate fallen, of which there were nearly 1,500, could expect a decent burial. Soldiers were buried in mass graves, hastily and without ceremony. It was a gruesome business that certainly tempered whatever joy the rebels felt over their victory. They could only take comfort in the fact that they were the ones digging the graves rather than the ones being thrown into them. <laughs> 
Although dismayed by the high cost of his victory, Robert E. Lee couldn't spend much time fretting over the carnage of the battle. He was determined to keep after the enemy, so that there would be yet another somber post-battle cleanup, but hopefully next time the majority of the victims would be wearing blue, and the Confederate victory would be all the sweeter. Lee, however, was forced to pause while he considered all of McClellan's possible options now that the entire Federal Army was south of the Chickahominy. Lee decided that McClellan was going to take one of three possible courses, all involving retreat. McClellan could move east to protect his supply line and the railroad, thus retaining the possibility of eventually turning the tables and relaunching an offensive against Richmond. McClellan could also choose to retreat back the way he had come, down the peninsula toward Williamsburg, Yorktown, and Fort Monroe, and the York River, where the Navy's gunboats could assist him. From down the peninsula, he could regroup and potentially start the campaign over again if he wished. Last, McClellan could retreat south to the James River, where he could be supplied by water and be under the protective umbrella of the Union gunboat's big cannon. Lee didn't know which course McClellan would take, though his hunch, the guess that had driven Lee's actions so far, was that Little Mac would protect his supply line. Lee assumed that his opponent would want to maintain the option to resume the offensive once he weathered the Confederate storm, and he would need the railroad and his supply base at White House Landing to do that. But Lee wasn't going to move his entire army on that hunch. He had, after all, been wrong the day before. So now, Lee sent Jeb Stuart's cavalry and Ewell's division east toward White House Landing to see what efforts McClellan was making to safeguard his supply base and the railroad. So the long and the short of it is that Lee was forced to wait until he learned something definite about McClellan's plans. By mid-afternoon on June 28th, Lee received word from Stuart that effectively eliminated the first option. Yule's troops had discovered that Little Mac wasn't going to fight for the railroad, and Stewart's troopers found that White House Landing had been abandoned by the Federals. So McClellan wasn't retreating east to protect his supply base, but was he withdrawing down the peninsula? Lee didn't receive the answer to that question until the next day, the 29th, but by Sunday, Lee was convinced that McClellan was retreating south to the James. He sent a message to Jefferson Davis stating as much, then confidently declared that, quote, the whole army has been put in motion upon this supposition. In fact, the army had, since by the time Lee sent that message to Davis, he had already issued orders to his division commanders. By Sunday, June 29th, despite missteps along the way, Lee had still accomplished the first goal he had set for his campaign, He had seized the initiative and compelled McClellan to come out from behind his fortifications and abandon his plans for besieging Richmond. But now Lee still wanted more. He wasn't content with merely driving the enemy army away from Richmond. Lee still wanted to destroy McClellan's army. Such a decisive result would possibly end the war. Robert E. Lee and George McClellan both believed as much. So now Lee would strive to administer the coup de grace on the retreating Federals, while Little Mac would endeavor to complete his change of base to the James and save the Army of the Potomac. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is Mr. Lincoln's Army by Bruce Catton. You know, every Civil War buff probably remembers the first time they read a Bruce Catton book, right? Or, if you've never read one, now you're probably wondering, hey, how's come I've never read a Bruce Catton book? Well, anyway, we decided that 160 and some episodes into this Civil War podcast, it was probably high time we recommended one of Mr. Catton's classic accounts. So here you go. In Mr. Lincoln's Army, he takes a look at the early life of the Army of the Potomac, well, up through Antietam, and he chronicles the increasingly strained relationship between Lincoln and McClellan, and the book concludes with the President finally sacking the General. So that's Mr. Lincoln's Army by Bruce Catton. <laughs> 
Don't forget you can find all of our book recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. We have some new members of the Strawfoot Brigade to thank this week, Rose, Jeffrey, Paul, and Robert. And thanks to Rose for her donation also. Yep, thanks Rose. And thanks to all you guys for listening to this episode of The Civil War. 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope you'll join us next time when we get to the next battle of the Seven Days Campaign, the Clash at Savage's Station. So that'll be next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.